Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to an episode of The Yard Tenders with Mac and Dan. I am Dan, he is Mac. Hi! As a reminder, we do this show in order to consume and review and observe arts and typically the execution of said arts and how it's put out into the world and our thoughts on the piece of matter. Now, this week, we're doing something a little bit different as we do, you know, every time. This time, we're actually doing an album by Taylor Swift called Folklore. It released last year in July, and when I say last year, I mean July 2020. It is an album entirely, it is entirely a product of the quarantine that has happened in the year of 2020 due to COVID-19. Uh, it was also paired with a documentary concert film called Folklore, The Long Pond Studio Sessions, which you can watch on Disney+. Plus. And like I said, it is an album by T-Swizzle, and it is also written and produced by Aaron Desner and Jack Antonoff. Now, what's interesting about this pick, Mac, is that you were the one that selected it for our conversation right now, but you led with the fact that you wanted to do this because you wanted me to be angry, or you wanted it to be like a hate watch, right? Or a hate observation as and i presume meaning i was going to hate it when in fact mac i really just enjoy this album and you want to know something and like listen really fast yeah, this yeah, is also yeah. before like as another sort of uh, context to this album like i said it was entirely a product of the quarantine not a single song was made pre-quarantine it was all fresh from, you know, last year, 2020. It was also Grammy winner for Album of the Year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, like, the Grammys that were in 2021, the 63rd Grammy Awards. But you were saying, I'm so sorry for cutting you off. No, I mean, uh, I, it's funny that you say that because I, as I was driving over here, was thinking to myself, oh, I, I really wish that I wouldn't have told Danny that I didn't like it because now he's going to do everything in his power to like it. And that's not true. And it's happened every time. And <laughs> okay, it has happened every time, but that doesn't mean <laughs> it's a coincidence. It's apparently true. But <laughs> no, like <laughs> I want. I guess maybe it's like me trying to give it a fair shake. Yeah. Here's the difference. Though. Sure. Here's the difference. Um. So let let me ask you. Yeah. Was your first exposure to this album just strictly the music from the album? Yes. Got it. Because my first exposure to the oh, album the, was watching the, the, documentary. the documentary that was on Disney Plus, right? It. So all of the songs, for those of you who don't know, all the songs on the album are performed in this documentary. What makes this documentary special is the fact that this album was recorded entirely separately from one another, as in the people that were involved in it. So Taylor Swift, Aaron Desner, and Jack Antonoff were never in the same room together putting together this album. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Which is very, very impressive. Yeah. Uh, considering, like, I mean, how difficult it is to make art generally. Just, yeah. I mean, like I said, from a very general scale. And then consider the factor of them never being in the same room together. You don't realize how much of a burden that is until you're not in the same room together. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what makes the documentary so special is the fact that later on, a few months later, or sometime later, after the album released, is that those three individuals, Ta Taylor Swift, Darren Desner, Jack Antonoff, got together in this, like, cabin in Hudson, New York, and for, like, a couple of days or so, and just performed all of the songs from the album together, I believe, for the first time with one another mm -hmm. in person. And so it gives a completely different feel uh, to the album and to the original production, uh, as well as uh, it's it's a little bit of uh, flavor and much more live instrumentation as opposed to um, a more fancy production quality to it. Um, but like I said, it provides a different flavor, and you're able to listen to that version of the album. But let's get into the spiciness of today, and the fact of the matter is. I was watching this, and I was listening to the music, and I was like, look, it's not the most impressive thing in the world, but I dig it. You know, hand me a shovel. You know, and I will <laughs> and I will dig it. I will happily dig it, like from right. holes. Now, but you did not dig it. No. Why was that? Because, uh, now, mind you, I don't think this album is lyrically impressive. Sure. But I wasn't also expecting it to be. Like, yeah, I had right, very right, low right, expectations. Right. I 
did think I was going to hate it. I've right. never had an interest in Taylor Swift, but I was listening to this and I was thinking to myself, hey, this is pretty good. And considering that uh, the music, everything was written rather quickly uh, when uh -huh. it comes to – it was recorded you know, in April to July, right? That's a very short time period. Oh, yeah. And supposedly with the process – of it, uh, T. Swizzle said herself that it was a collection of songs and stories that flowed like a stream of consciousness. And I found the quality of it, just like considering that it was stream of consciousness in the work, right? It wasn't really refined and edited that much. I found the quality to be very, very impressive considering that. But why was it, do you think, that you did not like this album? I, I think there were quite a few things that went into it, to be honest. Um, I, I think that, uh, I actually used to be a pretty big Taylor Swift fan. Wow. Not like, you know, not not like just die hard, but I really No, did. no, it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry. I'm going to let it I'm going to let my freak flag fly. Um <laughs> no, I I actually w just did follow her career pretty closely growing yeah. up. Um and I was always interested by her. And I really really did like uh Taylor Swift the debut album. I I liked mm -hmm. uh Fearless. Um I liked Speak Now. I I I I liked a lot of her earlier um, back to December type uh, stuff. Right. And it was all fine. I actually even fucked with Red. Um, right. But the second... Uh -huh. I, I remember where I was okay. when I heard Bad Reputation for the first time. Bad Reputation. Now remind me, is this a song from around like 2016, 2017, that era where like all of a sudden Taylor Swift came back, released a single out of nowhere, and it had this this weird part in the middle where it was like an interlude or a bridge in the song. It was like Taylor's not here right now. Leave a yes. message. Oh my god. Okay. Yes. I'm so I'm happy because I also want to make it clear that I also think that's not a good song. Yeah. 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 That, well, well, okay. So Bad Reputation is the is the album. Okay. Um, is that album and i think that that entire album is like a flaming pile of garbage wow it's i i would go as far as to say that it is the biggest letdown of an album that i've ever experienced okay and i remember where i was when i heard the album for the first time or heard a part of it and it was look what you made me do that's Thank that you. song Thank yeah you. Okay. look what you made me do right nice and <laughs> thanks <laughs> <laughs> and i remember i was in uh like the a campus restaurant Okay. Uh, SMU campus. Yeah, yeah, okay. Max Place, and I'm I'm sitting there in line. Oh, sorry. I, there's a there's a not restaurant me. sort of thing called Max Place at Southern Methodist not me, University. Mac. Yes, it's separate Mac. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there in line, and the song comes on, and I'm like, God, what's this garbage? And then I was like, Wait, is that? I can't. I know this voice, and I Shazam it, and my heart just sank. I was like. Oh, et tu brute? Like, I, like, everything <laughs> just faded. I was like, shit, my life. Because it was genuinely so, so, so bad. Right, okay. Um, and I think, because it, it's really like, she did Bad Reputation, and then Folklore was her next one. Her next album. Really? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, keep please. looking at this. Um, and it... It, it, it really made me... Oh, yeah, sorry. Reputation, not Bad Reputation. Bad Reputation, bad reputation I think, is, a, is an Avril Lavigne song. Re okay, Reputation had a bad reputation, but she also released Lover in between in 2019. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was a, like oh, an 11-month 11, 11 difference between Lover and Folklore, which is a really small turnaround. Mind you, I haven't, yeah. I haven't listened to Lover. I can't speak on that matter. But, oh, uh, no, no I, I remember listening to Lover and kind of grouping it in with... Uh, um, folklore because uh -huh. i kind of listened to them around the same time for the first time but okay. anyway um oh that's funny yes and so i i think that after reputation uh -huh. everything to come from her it's not just that um uh it, it's not just that like man she doesn't sound like she used to or whatever i think it's not that she has evolved i think that she is specifically sold out and it makes me sad sold out how like how how is this music now different than the tea swizzle of the past um i think that taylor swift in my mind was always such a big fucking deal because she was always like the leader in pop music in terms right. of like she yeah. was at the at the helm of the ship she was the one steering the ship of pop music let in me its, in its direction let me know if this is a sizzle serve yeah i think taylor swift is an artist of a generation. I agree. 
Yeah. I agree. I, I think it's like her and maybe Ed Sheeran. Yeah. You might could debate say, Adele, but she just hasn't released enough music. Yeah. But like in terms of like popular yes. music, uh and, and and but like pop music, right? Yeah. There's something about those two that just always find a way to yeah. like be always. big whenever they drop right. an album. Correct, yeah. Right. And, and and the main thing is that it's been so consistent. Yeah. Like Katy Perry has been at that level, but she's faded and come back and faded and come back. And Adele, everything that she shits turns to gold. Right. But it's just that she hasn't done it as yeah. consistently. And this isn't really a often. discredit to no. other artists, not no. at all. But there's there's no. something about the uh, gross is an interesting word for me to use, but it, but ahead, I mean yeah. gross popularity. Yeah, it's insane. It's it's yeah it's magnificent right and and the thing that always was so impressive i mean yes yeah, she was young but the main thing that was impressive to me was that she was always at the at the head of the ship in terms yeah. of steering where pop music went for next. 10 years for 10 years for 10 whole exactly like she really like to hold that shit and it was a big ass deal um and, and it's difficult for a lot of artists to maintain a sort of identity. And yeah. then it's it's very typical for an artist to, like, lose identity and also then lose popularity. Right, right, right. Where, right. where you may be uh, accusing, a strong word, but accusing Taylor Swift of losing her identity, but her popularity has not faded at all. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, if you look at, like, the past five years, pretty much, yeah. like... Every single big song or every single big artist that, like, breaks through on the world scale, not just America, but on the world scale, um, with uh, maybe the exception of Ariana Grande, maybe, I would say is some sort of fusion music. People, like, like, sh but sh it's funny because if you think about it, and if you, like, really try and go back in history, Taylor Swift was really like the w one of the main innovators and pioneers of the fusion movement meaning like taking two different genres and trying to find a way to make them meld together yeah like she was she, she was like an icon because she was right in between the worlds of country and pop in a very popular a long vein. time yes exactly yeah and, and it was and it was a huge deal because everyone was always fighting like which one is she and she was constantly like why can't why not both uh, por que no los dos exactly um, as the taco commercials say yes. um and so she was doing that and then she even whenever she started like branching off into other things like it was it was still a huge deal and she was always um i mean she wasn't making like the most unbelievably original music but she was always making cool new music that sounded new yeah um and everyone was following her lead yeah exactly and ever since reputation i feel like that's not the case anymore uh -huh. it feels like she is now following the others leads okay and that kind of pisses me off okay it makes me sad um that i don't think that the the, the, the sounds that she has uh made have been entirely original uh -huh. um or entirely uh, uh, innovative. Whenever she releases something, I'm like, oh, yeah, more of this shit. And not like more of her shit. I mean more of like mainstream pop shit. Like she has kind of fallen into that category. Okay. And now now other people like, I think I think the biggest example of like pioneers of pop music right now, I think it's safe to say is like Billie Eilish. I was, I was thinking that too. When you were leading up to that statement, I was yeah. thinking, ah. But the first name that's popping into my head is Billie Eilish. Yeah, yeah, like, she's at the head of the ship right now. Yeah. And whatever the fuck she does, everyone follows. Yeah. Um, and it's not that, it, it, like, she can do anything. It's that she actually makes really, really good shit. Yeah. And it sounds like nothing we've ever heard before. And Taylor was doing that and is now not anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might just be because, like, she's hit that age. But it's tough and it's really difficult for me to watch... Because it's not that, oh man, she's like kind of faded out of the limelight. It's that she is trying desperately to sound new and in doing so is simply not. So now let's transition to yeah. this album. So, okay, with this album, the thing that makes me upset about this album specifically okay. is that I I think it like the second half is way better than the first. I agree. Um, but the first, it's tough because... There were, I, I kid you not, I really am not joking when I say this. There were times when the song changed and I didn't even notice. That's fair. 
And like I like maybe the first five songs, like up to Mirrorball, are this same sounding song. I I mean I dispute that a little bit, mind you. Like my first introduction. And I hate saying that, by the way. I hate saying <laughs> that. Like I I really not only because I love her, but also because. I I try so hard to steer people away from that mindset of like it all sounds the same because it's like no 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 give it a chance and like oh I only like these certain like genres of music it's like no that's so limiting you can't like, you can't place that on yourself but I I think it's safe to say in this specific instance that it really actually does all sound the same. Go ahead. I I I think I I understand where you're coming from and that I mean that is typical in a lot of albums uh and I imagine. So it's not typical in the rest of her music because mm -hmm. so so what was interesting at least about watching the documentary was she mentions at one point in like a studio album this and I'm paraphrasing here yeah this is the first time that I'm not being a hundred percent autobiographical and we huh. primarily we primarily see it in three songs uh one of those songs being in like the first five we see it in Cardigan August. And Betty. And those three songs are this sort of trilogy where it's following the same uh, romantic, it's not the same romantic relationship, but kind of the story of it is uh, high school lost love, but she's actually singing as other characters, right? Like it's, oh, yeah. according to her, like this is the first time that she's not actually singing as herself. She has a story for these other characters. So I feel like for those, at least for those three songs, those three songs maybe sounding a little bit of the same. I think that is where Taylor Swift really hits her stride in this album. Like if I had to give a gold medal, it'd be to those three songs. Uh -huh. Because what draw what drew me so much to this album was not necessarily the lyrics. And occasionally it was the instrumentation because I do I I enjoyed Desner's and Antonov's work in this in this piece. But what really drew me was the act, like the storytelling of not just those three songs, but generally for a lot of these songs. I thought the storytelling in My Tears Ricochet was very, very strong. And the, the idea of, uh, and it's, you know, of course, a common theme, but the idea of loving each other so immensely and now we're not. And uh, I'm once again kind of paraphrasing the song here, but uh, I'm dead to you, so why are you at my funeral? It's just something like it's corny yeah. stuff like that. But how she tells the story, not not necessarily through the lyrics, but it's it's the lyrics in tandem with her vocals and with the instrumentation that I think this album really succeeds. And so then when you get something like Cardigan, like August, like Betty, where she's actually speaking as other characters it's actually really fun to just be a part of the ride and be a part yeah. of the story and then what i appreciate so much about august in particular is is a sort of more light heart light beaded music that's juxtaposed with this girl who thought this relationship was real with this guy but actually this guy was mentally somewhere else yeah. the entire time and he admits to it in Betty. Like, I love how yeah. songs can be connected story-wise. I always love and appreciate that. I think one of the best albums I've ever listened to, uh, and I don't I also don't think it's going to be the last time I'm gonna reference Kendrick Lamar in this uh, discussion for some reason. Oh my he God, just seems that's like so funny. he just seems like the right comparison. But Good Kid Mad City, right? That entire album, his second studio album, that entire album is a story. And all of those stories are intertwined and interconnected, while this album, Folklore, is more stream of consciousness. But when the stream of consciousness actually holds a story, then it gets to be, in this case, really, really engrossing. And so I understand the criticism, how some of these songs can sound the same, and maybe in the per first five, right? Like, I don't think... The One or The Last Great American Dynasty, like, it does itself any favors. Neither does Seven. But I think there are some songs that, when really put together, when you look at it as a whole, when you look at its individual parts, it's fine. But when you look at it as a whole, uh, I think this album can be very fantastic. Yeah. I, I would say, though, that... After listening to it a few times, because I understand the storytelling things, and I do actually really want to get into that, 
but in, in terms of the sounding the same, I was like, I I don't because I again, like I said, I because look, that. and and I had that I experience wanna... a little bit with Rex Orange County's Pony. Oh, you know, sure. That, like that, but that's also going to happen with albums yeah. in general. Yeah. And that's just sort of what happens when you listen to an album sometimes, like clean through. Yeah. There's something like Good Kid, Mad City. Like that's an exception because each song is completely different from one another with what it's trying to do in yeah. the service of the story. Yeah. As opposed to this, where it's just mostly three people. Uh, if not, it's Taylor Swift's boyfriend or uh, the lead singer of Bon Iver. Like, it's just three people working on this album. So it's yeah. only natural that a lot of it is going to sound similarly. Especially right, when... Right. like. S songs don't sound similarly when you listen to them again and again and again and again. When you really study them and look at it with a magnifying glass. But right. I'm so sorry for cutting no, no, no. You off. Yeah, they're, they're, um, and I think that the thing that made uh, Rex Orange County sound the same in terms of like song to song is that uh, it, it wasn't the music or the lyrics or the stories. It was that he can only do so many things with his voice. So his voice is pretty much going to do the same thing every time. Yeah. And so in terms of just like the vocal quality. It's going to be pretty much the same every song you hear. Mm -hmm. And that's where it starts to blend in. With this, it is not really... For, for the first time, because usually all of her albums are very much like, oh god, it's the same story. It's, yeah. It's, we're like, the same tone, thing every like time. tonally, the album is intact and it's clean uh, in that regard. Like, in the tone. Yeah. But usually the thing that's so cool is the sounds, is the music. And in this one, it's the exact opposite, where they she's starting to play with with lyrics she's starting to play with storytelling yeah but um in terms of actual sound 14 of the 16 songs are in 4-4 mm -hmm. which is a specific choice oh yeah what and, and what is 4-4 um it's it's that whenever you're writing um like on on uh, a grid like on a scale uh you are in each measure you're only allowing yourself four beats of right. time and so yeah so so it's a difference between one, two, three, one, two, three. And it's it, it's where it's where you hit. It's it's where the pulse of the song comes from. And for her, it's always on four. And and that's fine, I guess. But it's just kind of like a very standard choice. And then um she's 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 not like a hundred percent along like like the four chords thing. Right. But she really she, does she does break out of it like occasionally, and you can hear it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of just chorus. We pretty much have seven chords mm -hmm. that 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 we stick to throughout the entire album, and then but like we still we still are only going to use the four chord format, but just with one of these seven, okay, pretty much the whole time, and and that's and and that that got frustrating after a while because I was just like, man, I I listen to you because of the sounds, and all the sounds are kind of kaput right now. Um, but yeah, she did actually have a lot of really cool uh, stuff that uh, in, in terms of storytelling. Yeah. Um, and I did... Uh... But, like, when she took that opportunity, right? Like, that wasn't the case with every song on right. this album. Right. You know? Yeah, and, and, and so, well, I, I actually... I would actually uh, like to bring up a, a, a few cool songs that this reminds me of that okay. I think I can make a decent point on. Okay. But when do we come back from a word from our sponsor? All right, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Now, just let me explain. First of all, it's free. Second of all, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and a whole bunch more. And third, now this is really important, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hear me when I say no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Alrighty, and welcome back to the Art Tenders. So we left off with uh, I wanted to talk about a couple songs with you over the break. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so I showed you four songs, and uh, to to give a little bit of backstory, um, there was a very shitty remake of High School Musical um, that turned into a series. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going into it. Um, and uh, and then also there's this the show, show called uh, Girl Meets World. Yeah, um, classic. Yeah, and so uh, don't watch it. I mean, just yeah, watch no, Boy no, Meets no, World. No, 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 no. This is this is not to be recommended. Um, but. Uh, the, which you'd watch that, by the way. I have... Going to world. <laughs> Unfortunately. Good for you. Um, the, uh, 
So the two leads of the High School Musical thing got were about to get together and like we're thinking about it and we're flirting and everything and then um, he decided to wait until she became of age, um, which yeah. makes sense. Uh, and so they you just kind of waited it out and then in that time of waiting or waiting until you know actually date, um, uh, he ended up dating the lead of Girl Meets World. And so the the girl that was in High School Musical, Olivia Rodrigo, she made a song called Driver's License, which became the number one song in the world recently. Um, and then uh, to that, because she mentions, not she not directly, but she kind of alludes to Sabrina Carpenter in her song. Who Sabrina is the Car girl from Girl, girl Meets World? world. Uh, she the blonde one. felt the need to make a clapback song, kind of like a diss track to... <laughs> it's a diss track. To no, no, yeah. no, 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 stop, 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 stop. Do, 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 do not... Do not say kind a kind of. of like a diss track no it like totally is for these uh teenagers yes oh yeah is, oh yeah oh yeah and like it with with <laughs> savage lines such as um you try to get under my skin uh while he's on mine god damn it's, that's that crazy. is roasty spicy it really is and so uh um so she made that song and then the boy the dumb, dumb boy that was in the middle of it all, he decided to make a song of his own. Yeah. And <laughs> Which is actually, hold on. It's a pretty song. It's a pretty good song. It's fun. It like reminds me of NSYNC and I love NSYNC. So I'm like, yeah, this is actually pretty good. It's a very fun one. But yeah. at, at its essence is a dumb, dumb song yeah. um, called Lies, Lies, Lies. Uh, and then, and so those were all very dumb. And then eventually, uh, Olivia Rodrigo in the past week has... Uh, released another song or i guess by the time that we post this but in the past two weeks um released another song called deja vu and it's actually a lyrically very clever song and it's really mature in comparison to all of the other three songs and i'm only saying this because it kind of reminds me of the style of lyricism that taylor swift has mm -hmm. um because early on in her career like you're talking about her autobiographical style right and it really is a matter of she did not know how to say anything other than exactly what the fuck was on her mind. It wasn't just that she wasn't able to create characters. It was also that she was not able to code or use any figurative language or poeticism to mask what she was feeling or to, you know, make it into some interpretive type thing that was clever. It was just exactly what the fuck she was thinking. But let's also understand the context, too, of the fact that you get really popular making music about yourself. Then you're probably going to do that. It? Exactly. Why would, right. why would you stop? Well, you would probably keep doing that for a while, right? Unless you unless you finally put your foot down and you're like, no, I want to do something different. And and the first three songs that we listened to, the first, uh, Driver's License and then Sabrina Carpenter and then Joshua Bassett, uh, Skin and Lies, Lies, Lies was um, they the, the, the problem with all of them is and and the thing that honestly makes you laugh more than anything because it's not like man what what amazing song you just kind of laugh at them because like the things that they're saying are just so silly because yeah. they are exactly what a you know a high schooler would say or like a teenager would say um, and it's it's very clear that their marketing team didn't really look very hard or, like, they didn't pass it by anyone. They just wrote this shit in a couple hours. It's also funny for us to, like, be commenting on this because we're not, like, that, that many much older. years yeah. removed no. from these, you know, storylines that were right. around us, right? But but we can at least look at these and be like, uh, I mean, you could have done better than that, right? <laughs> just, like, give it, like, a, you know... Sure, yeah, here and there. Just a here quick there. look over. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but the thing that really separates between that and uh, her song Deja Vu that just recently came out. Are you is talking that about Olivia, Olivia, Olivia Rodrigo? Olivia Rodrigo, yeah. Okay. Um, is, that, um, is that it's actually really clever and, and really pretty well done. Um, yeah. Especially lyrically. Like, overall, it's pretty good, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's uh, she actually uses figurative yeah. language. And also the, I mean, we were looking at the music video for it as well, and this is kind of separate, but the direction for the music video is also a lot stronger. Way, way stronger, that yeah. One. Yeah, like there, there, are, there are actual artistic choices that are made, rather than just like them rolling around Images, the desert. Images, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like fucking Lies, 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 where yeah. he's literally just rolling around 
in yeah. dress clothes in the but desert. But using but using the uh the story of the song and then directing it like and using it like as a medium, right? Like not having the sort of music video be separate from the song, if that makes any sense. Yes. Like in terms of lyrically, in terms of performance, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and she also It's also a better song. Has her own voice th th this is another thing i whenever i listen to olivia rodrigo's two songs remember we're reviewing folklore yeah i know i know i know okay um the first one driver's license and the last one the, the uh deja vu the big difference for me is that uh between those two and the other two that we heard which was joshua bassett and sabrina carpenter is that it sounds like she actually wrote her songs from an actual em emotional place mm -hmm. whereas the other ones it felt a little bit um like it was a publicity stunt like it felt kind of like showy um and kind of dumb and so it, it it just felt a lot uh different i don't know and, and but that, but that's something that, that taylor swift always had taylor swift has always been about very honest very autobiographical very direct yeah. songwriting and she is really venturing um into this this other you know the, these other styles and that's fine but because of that it seems like she has put uh the sound and the music in in the back seat or at least for the past three albums okay that, that that's that, that that's really where i'm coming from with the whole like comparison Livia Rodrigo thing is that uh, I really wish that um, that she could go off and, and venture into this new style. And take more... Well, I mean, but didn't she take a risk in Reputation, wouldn't you say? Oh, I, I would say she took a risk. <laughs> I would say that for sure. She she definitely took some risks. So it's not it's not you wanting T-Swizzle to take risks. What is it in particular that you believe um, is different, is different? Uh, I I want her to figure out what what her new sound is. Like find new been, inspiration. She's been testing sounds for a while, where sure. she's like, I can't be shoved in a box, and so she's kind of like like going to all these different sounds and trying them out, okay. and it is it's 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 tough for me to hop onto. This, but um, from my understanding, mind you, I haven't listened to a lot of Taylor Swift, but this album doesn't seem anything unfamiliar to Taylor Swift's music, Not would you say? Or at least like Taylor Swift of the past. It, I mean, it uses some more instruments. Like at 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 essence, it is still going to be mainly uh, like country based. I mean, this is like folk, base, you know. Uh, it mainly is called folklore, acoustic guitar, yeah. mainly soft percussion. Yeah. And like that's that 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 is kind of her vibe. Yeah. Yeah. And there are none of these songs. None of these songs, I think, are like poorly done, or anything. At least yeah. I don't. I don't think so. I I don't think there are any songs that I'm like, God, it's trash. But I will say that they're also. This is all super spicy of you. Now I sometimes I know it doesn't mean much, but I <laughs> it, like just from uh sort of like observing observer right bird's eye view. I do really enjoy the fact. That this album won album of the year okay. for the Grammys. Okay, let me just say <laughs> this: this is the reason that I decided to talk about it today. Okay, this is the thing that like because I I had I've had these opinions for a long time. It's that the fact that it won album of the year makes me want to scream. Okay, so why is that? Because I also want to discuss that and I'm, I'm also going to pull up right now while you believe that uh, this does not deserve yeah. uh, album of the year i'm gonna pull up the other nominees for oh please go ahead for that grammy um i i think that it made me so unbelievably mad because i partially because i'm a huge fan and love the other albums this year right like the the other contestants um that that i wish that they would contestants nominees mac nominees. Contestants, my bad. if they didn't <laughs> sign up for this competition yeah nominees nominees that um i i do wish that uh that that they would have gotten that uh, over her but also it's just this is not album of the year material period point blank there is nothing innovative about this 
There was nothing like amazing and impressive that was like earth shattering. And, and that's usually what album of the year goes to. It's it's to the best album of the year. And this simply, simply was not. Even if I was to, after this conversation, say, you know what? Maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was. Because I, I it's not trash. It's just not good. And it pisses me off that it's not good. Um, that, that That's where I am. But it's that everything that it's next to is really good. Coldplay actually had a really pretty decent fucking album. So to give uh, context as, a, as to who were the other nominees we have, and I hope to God I'm pronouncing all this correctly. Uh, Chilombo, uh, that was that's just sounded weird out of my mouth, uh, by Jeanne Aiko. Jeanne Aiko, yeah. Oh. Uh, we have Black Pumas by yes. Black Pumas. We have Everyday Life by Coldplay. We have Jesse, Jesse. Volume yeah. 3 by Jacob Coyer. Uh, we have Wom Women in Music Part 3 by Haim. Uh, Future Nostalgia by Dua Lipa, and Hollywood's Bleeding by Post Malone. I think it's Haim, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I gotta say, though... Um... I haven't listened to any of those other albums. Like, I mean, I've listened to some Janae, Aiko, Coldplay, Jacob Coyier, but like, I haven't... I've not dived into these albums. Yeah. Just want to say that. I, I will say that I've listened to, to all of them except for the Haim one. Yeah. Um. Uh. Not not all the way through, but I've I've listened to enough to have opinions about all of them. Yeah. And uh, and I gotta say, four should have beaten Taylor Swift. Now listen, listen. I understand. I understand because I kind of agree. Uh, it's it's interesting that it's kind of crazy that it won, right? Yeah. We yeah, can agree. Like on that. you listen to this album, and yeah, I didn't. I did not think album of the year material either yeah oh uh, if you i mean if you're looking at this album in a vacuum right when you are not considering the fact that this was entirely quarantine made yeah then it makes the album a whole lot more unimpressive however mac don't take out this frustration on T Swizzle. T Swizzle didn't ask for this, yeah, Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now but I, it's I the understand. Type of shit that makes me start believing conspiracy theories. Take it out on the what? Wait, what? Yeah, it's it's like this where I'm like, this was like set up. This was the industry that's no. like propelling this this star that they've made and all the money and. Uh, I listen. Yeah. No, listen. I do think a big reason as to why this one album of the year. My assumption is that. I checked all the dates of when, like, the rest of those albums were recorded, and this was the only album to have been recorded and done entirely during quarantine. Sure. And I think, contextually, I think that's a big difference, right? Yeah. That on its own, is this album cream of the crop? No, no. I wouldn't think so. Um, I think Taylor Swift does some very cool things in this album like i said before i think the storytelling is strong and i really now like i really want to listen to an album of hers that like okay what if this entire thing is a story instead of like each individual song song being their own theme or their own story yeah. what if we have an entire album that is just a story and it's her telling a story because she'll find the lyrics regardless like the the lyricism to this music is not the most impressive part. It's not what makes, and well, it does partially what makes Taylor Swift Taylor Swift, right? But it's it's less about the creativity and lyrics and more about what she's saying with the lyrics. And so I'm be really interested in music by her that's one cohesive story yeah. throughout like twelve to fifteen songs. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. And but don't uh, take this out on T Swizzle. But I, it, it's really hard not to is the thing because, it, well, this is the other thing. I, I'm not necessarily mad directly at Taylor Swift for the album of the year, I'm mad at her for other reasons. But um, I'm, I'm mad at folklore. I'm, I'm mad at the, the album. I'm mad at yeah, just the fact that it it won out over so many really really. But that's good not. That, uh, it's not their fault, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand naturally, like, it's going to have you kind of rub off onto folklore. Like, yeah. why would you do this, you know? Yeah, a little bit. I, but, like, the, but the, this it's is important the to take that... it to the context. It's really, really important to take it to the context of this album and understand the context of these people were yeah. never in a room together. Once you take yeah, it into that context, right, it makes right. it really impressive. I agree. I agree that shouldn't be the basis for your album of the, of the year, right? Yeah, right. Like, um, 
let's take let's use uh, the Academy Awards as a sort of analogy sure. here. I think in 2014, there there was a movie called Birdman that yeah, won, won that won uh, best movie, right? And I think what made it controversial is that there was another movie that year that seemed to be like an instant uh, Academy Award winning grab for best picture. That was a movie called Boyhood. Mm -hmm. What made Boyhood so interesting was how it was made, not necessarily the contents of the movie, right? Because if you just look at the contents of the movie, it's fine. So, Danny, how was Boyhood made? Well, Boyhood was made over like a 12-year... Richard, Richard year... Linklater, right? Yes. Yeah. It was made over a 12-year span. And so what it did was essentially these like 12, 13 different scenes uh, of this boy's life, but throughout... Literally 12 to 13 years, right? So you would get a scene from when he was five, a scene when he was six, seven, etc., etc., etc. So it makes for really, really interesting film because you're quite literally seeing these people grow up. Yeah. And that really helps with the storytelling and with the production and the direction and everything involved. It enhances the movie, right? But when you don't take that context into consideration, when you're just purely looking at it from a movie standpoint it's fine yeah like it doesn't really do anything right there's not really a cohesive plot to it which is fine it's more so like a sort of uh tonally theme what they're kind of going for um but the big selling point and what makes that movie so impressive for the most part is like keeping all those actors and keeping those kind of storylines a little bit alive right and, and so you check in with a char few characters here and there um but what makes it so impressive is the production of it. Yeah. And that's what makes Folklore so impressive, is the production of it. Now, Boyhood didn't win Academy Award of the Year, and I do think Birdman was a better movie, right? Yeah. If you take out that context, it is absolutely a better movie. Mind you, it was also directed phenomenally yeah. as well. Um, but if you take the context of Folklore into the fact of okay, this was all recorded separately. That's really, really impressive. Mind you, I do recommend to you, Mac, to watch the, the documentary. documentary. That seems because, to be a big difference maker. Because I think this was a difference maker for me, was that it wasn't necessary, ne necessarily the lyrics or maybe even the production at that point. Because the production at that point... Uh, Desner, Antonoff, and Swift were all in the room together. The production at that point doesn't matter. Uh, so then it just became about the performance. And then it made me realize, wow, Taylor Swift is like a treat to watch perform. Mm -hmm. And she she is innately a performer. She doesn't, it's nothing big or bombastic, but it's nice to just see an artist move to their music. Yeah, And it's nice to just watch her sing and then her watch her body physically explore through that motion. And just something simple as her hand is going up when it's uh, reaching a higher pitch. Like something simple like that, right? But that really aids in the overall experience. I think that's what really aided my experience of the album was that not only was I listening to the album, but I saw those three people performing together. It's also a big thing of, now, if I'm not mistaken, those people were, like, performing together for the first time together in the same space. So that instantaneously and innately enhances the performance because it gives you that human element, right? That it's it's so difficult to maybe, uh, in the context of, like, theater, to do a monologue by yourself, to do a uh, self-tape where all you're speaking to is a camera, right? But to be active as an actor to be active in the scene and participating with another scene partner and let's say you're just using the same monologue makes it so much more electric because you're actively playing off one another right yeah and so that's what she's literally doing right she's literally playing off of antonoff and off of desner that she's literally quite playing off of them and, and they're playing off of each other, so it makes, even though it's a lot more intimate of a space and she's not performing in front of a huge crowd or anything, it makes it a lot more of an intimate and wonderful experience. Some artists, that isn't the case. There are probably some artists that it's best just to listen to their album. This is when I bring up Kendrick Lamar again, 
that <laughs> nice. smooth transition I just made, where a friend of mine was mentioning how she saw a Kendrick Lamar concert some time ago, and Kendrick Lamar is one of her favorite artists, but she was surprised by how underwhelmed that performance was for her. And I think Kendrick Lamar is a pretty decent example of, he's still going to be a great performer, don't, don't get me wrong, and his music is still fantastic, but how sometimes the transition from just performing in a studio and performing for on camera or in front of a crowd, those are always going to be different some way or another. And so the difference with this documentary was not only were these three like performing in front of a camera, but they were also kind of performing for each other. And that raised the enjoyment so much more. And just seeing them explore through the music together is an absolute treat. Should I have one album of the year? I don't know. Uh, if I listen to the other albums, you know. You only listen to one. And the nominees. Uh, I don't really think so. Um, but that didn't prevent me from enjoying the album, right? Now, mind you, I want to ask you really fast, Mac. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to say we're going to pause it here if, and we're going to pause it, uh, here if the answer is no. But have you listened to the song from the deluxe edition, The Lakes? No. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. And we're back. And the reason why I wanted to show Mac this album is because, so The Lakes was a song that was not featured in the uh, standard edition of Folklore. It's actually featured in the deluxe edition. Um, I think, uh, maybe this is a sizzle serve, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, I think the biggest mistake that this album makes is, is not putting that on the standard edition. Is not having that be the final song. Now, I think the biggest mistake, or I think why that's the biggest mistake is because a lot of the theming around this album, like tonally, uh, as well as during the time that it was made in, right? Because this is such a time capsule piece, this album, is a big theme is escapism, right? And like trying to get out of just something, right? And so... Yeah, and this I, isn't I, that. I, well, this is a little bit of that, of like her wanting... No, I think this is absolutely that. that this is her wanting to be in this like cabin somewhere else right this is this is her like she's always been writing about like those cabin songs but it's the fact that this wasn't a part of this album as well as how beautiful i believe this song is is a very strange choice i think it's like doubly so because like how does escapism apply to songs like uh, august or betty or or cardigan and it's because like at least in those three songs like it's once again her not telling a story about herself that so much of it is her trying to uh, reach out and tell stories about other people or other people's lives or just like what can happen in other people's lives. And so it's still playing into the idea of trying to get out. What is um, the situation that she's trying to get out of? It depends on the song, right? But in the case of The Lakes, I think is a really nice button to the album uh, in terms of how it's written and, and the lyrics to it. Mind you, once again, it's not the most impressive thing lyrically, um, but tonally, it's such a nice button because it's also this positive, more uplifting sort of thing compared to the final song in the standard edition, Hoax. Uh, it's such, it's like a sorbet. After a big, large, delicious meal, or at least uh, maybe mediocre meal to you, that it is a sorbet to clean your palate, and it, I really do think it ties the rest of the album together. I, I, I also don't think this is a sizzle serve, that that was better than everything that I listened to on the album. I, I think that well, was the best thing that I have heard. Um, now... Mac, I did show you, I did show you the, uh, the long pod studio sessions recording of it, uh, the one, the documentary that's on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I did show you that, like, video of it. And so the deluxe edition version, I think, uh, production-wise, it's a little bit different. Um, but what Mac saw was also the video of the performance, right? They're actively performing. This isn't like a mu music video where the director comes in and he puts some shots together. No, like these, it was essentially a concert. We were watching a mini concert. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, 
it, it was really good, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're so caught off guard! Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it was really great. Um, You're literally I'm trying to catch up. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to catch up a little bit in my head. Um, I think that it uh, solved a lot of the problems that I had lyrically. Uh -huh. um, to be honest, like, it, it actually did... Uh, it was very honest, and it got to a place that she... Definitely didn't in the rest of the album, I don't think. Yeah. Um, and whenever I say, whenever you're talking about escapism and, and what I meant by this isn't that, it's that it acknowledges the fact that uh, that that she is in a place and we are in a place where we need escapism. Yeah. Because it's kind of shitty right now, what we're all dealing with. Yeah. Um, that and like, and the song is not about like getting to this place and it's not necessarily about love per se. Like, they're like, there's a theme of wanting to get to this place and having a love involved like it's in the lyrics right but it's not those things explicitly right like it's 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 not about the it's it's not about the journey it's about the wish for the journey and it's yeah. not about trying to have this love it's it's more about i wish for this love to be with me for this uh like theoretical hypothetical journey yeah, and, and it was really nice that um, that it wasn't a direct cookie cutter story. Yeah. Um, because it, yeah, it, it it wasn't like. And it speaks to what everybody was going through, right? Like I don't yeah. think none of these other songs, I don't think in this album, sp actually speaks directly to the uh, current situation that everybody was going through in March, April, June, especially, like, during those months, right? And it's really hard to yeah. and this to song, escape. Yeah, and, and this song stuff. wasn't wasn't necessarily explicit and wasn't necessarily explicit in, you know, saying that and addressing what the world was experiencing during yeah. that time. But in terms of the mental state that everyone was going to like, the song fits perfectly. Like, not only is this, like, a time capsule album as a whole, but that song in particular, like, that resonates so much with what the world was going through during yes, that time. I, I, I totally agree. Um, and yeah, so it makes me really surprised that it doesn't, it's, it's not part of the album. standard edition. That's yeah, crazy to me. And she, she kind of addresses it in the documentary. She was like, you know, and then Hoax was a fine uh, entry, like a fine final entry for the album for the first few weeks. But then I was like, I, I needed something else to put on top of that. And I, I really, really wish that this album released with The Lakes as a she final song. Yeah. Good. Good. Or the, I mean, that was me towards the end. I really wish that it released with The, oh, uh, with oh. the Lakes. But that was, but she was expressing that sentiment yeah. of um, the, the Lakes. I needed something else. The Lakes is yeah. the, like, final song of this album. Like, it yeah, wasn't sure. just added to the deluxe edition. Like, no, that this this is the final song of this project. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that, yeah, it was, yeah, it was really lovely. Because, um, yeah, and what I meant by, like, the, the, the difference is that, yes, it's still in the escapism theme. Yeah. But it, it's really the only song that acknowledges that that's what it is. Yeah. Like, it's the only song that acknowledges where we are and, and why it's being made, you know? It's true. It's, it's kind of meta in that way. Yeah. Um, but not being uh, heavy-handed no, with no, it either. No, no. Um, which, honestly, it's really tough to... And this was a pro problem of mine early on in the, in the pandemic and everything, is um, that I felt like it was dishonest of me to not be talking about... The pandemic? The pandemic and any art that I was trying to make. But there was no real good way of talking about it because everything that I wanted to say has pretty much already been said. Because yeah. what are you going to say? Yeah. Um, and there was always this elephant in the room, right? Right. Especially, like, art during this time, you know? Like, yeah. everyone wanted to specifically talk about the pandemic. So we got, as a society, generally, and as a community, we generally got a lot of art that was pandemic centralized and was talking directly about the pandemic and the effects of that and the effects of isolation, right? Yeah. As opposed to, and what I really, actually, really, really appreciate about this album is that it's not necessarily talking about the pandemic, but it, it's just a product of the isolation. It's a product of the pandemic. Yeah. And then 
when you add the lakes to it, like once again, it's not explicitly stating it. It's putting it all together in a bow of like, this is a product of the time. Um, and of course, like, the rest of this album is very, very stream of consciousness, and sometimes it really succeeds, and sometimes it's like, okay, like, I could forget this song, uh, soon, right? Um, but like I said in the previous part, the fact that this was a stream of consciousness work that was not overly heavy-handed with, uh, talking about the pandemic, like, I guess, like, my standards are really low in that regard because it's difficult to come al come along good art nowadays when uh, in a uh, current slash, because we're in the middle of a current slash post-pandemic uh, world. This is our first piece of media, first piece of art that we are consuming that is entirely, you know, post Pandemic, yeah. shutdown yeah right, right right it's entirely that right i mean this podcast is for those of you who don't know is a product of the pandemic true very it true. is a po product of the lockdown and it is a product of we want to make something and that's partially reason why it is why i enjoyed this album so much Aww. was acknowledging the fact this is the product of the pandemic and this is a product of people getting together of just like i don't know what the hell is going on i have no idea what trajectory what trajectory my life or the world is even going all i know is right now is i want to make art and i want to do it with people that i love and people that i enjoy doing it with and so it's hard for me not to appreciate the album because of that. And even if, for me, if you take that context away from it, does the album suffer? A little bit, sure. But I don't think it's a bad album at all. Uh, and I think it's it's just a nice listen to. I think it's, it's one of those albums that maybe it's 9 p.m., you're driving down the highway, not a lot of cars around you, and you're just kind of listening to this album pretty casually, right? And it's a nice piece of art. And I appreciate it immensely for that reason man you get me a little emotional that was really good that made me really happy thank you yeah fuck yeah and yeah i mean yeah i i i, I can agree with that that's something that i never really even thought of like sure did this deserve album of the year mac no so like but we can still appreciate it yeah. for what it is yes yes um Context is everything for, I, for a lot of the stuff that we consume, you know? Yeah, before before we before we start stepping into conclusions, um, I I just want to make it clear that Jesse Volume 3 by Jacob Collier <laughs> should have won Album of the Year. Point blank, period. He's the only person that is making 100% original and innovative music. I've never heard a single sound of his anywhere else. It's Unfucking real. Anyway, that's just that's just record. When you take the context of the pandemic out of you know yes, all those nominees, right. then I think yeah yeah, yeah yeah. If you put that context back in, uh, it's it. I mean, it is really impressive that his album uh exists in this manner. Yeah. Uh, so that's I think that that's my piece. Yeah, that that's that's where you're coming from, and yeah, yeah and I. Honestly, the more we talked about it, yeah, I, 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 I can understand, and I, and I can agree. That this happened with Korra, too. Like, I, there needs to be something, or the legend, legend of Korra, there needs to be something that I hate and you love. There, there needs yeah. to be something of that that we right. get to eventually. We, we will. We, I, 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 can, I feel like we will. And we always come to a middle ground, which pisses me off. I yeah. wish that we would, I wish that we, we would just, like, fully fight. Um, but no, I, 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 I mean, I, I can agree that. This wasn't. You know what, Mac? You're wrong. You're wrong. N no, you're you're wrong. You're so wrong. You're so wrong about all of it. I'm sorry. Me too. So, Mac. Yes, sir. Any more final thoughts on this album? No, that's I. I um. Yeah, that I I I really yeah. uh, thought it was. Um, I I think it's fun to shit talk it because it definitely shouldn't have won album of the year, <laughs> but. At the same time, yeah, I mean, it's very impressive that it's done yeah. in, the, in the pandemic. And I actually want to go back and watch the documentary now, so thank yeah. you for that. It is a beautiful piece of work, and then triply so 
if you take it to, into the context oh, of the, the work that went into it. Right, right. And then if you watch the documentary, I think it's, it's just it nice. Shows. It's just nice. It's just really nice. We gotta really watch nice. the Jonas Brothers documentary soon. Okay, anyway. so anyways. Go ahead. Um, where, where, yeah, where no, I'm not gonna week? address that. So, um, Mac, we finished watching five seasons of The Wire. We did. It was a hell of a journey, hell of an experience, and we even did an interview with one of the writers, and who knows where that journey is going to take us. But right now, Mac, we're not leaving Baltimore quite yet. Oh, okay. So before The Wire, there was another show that David Simon and Ed Burns created. Oh, yeah? It was a miniseries. The Homicide? And no, 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 because Homicide, if I'm not mistaken, was, was, a, was a procedural? No. Christ, let me speak. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Was a homicide was like a procedural uh, uh, cop, you know, crime TV show. Uh, I believe it premiered in like 1997. No, 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 no. This was the baby before the wire. This show crawled so the wire could walk and then run. It was made by David Simon and Ed Burns. Still takes place on in Baltimore. And even uh, Raphael, uh, our good buddy that we interviewed not too long ago, uh, he even talked about the show very briefly. He alluded to it. This show is also on HBO, and it is called... Actually, no, I lied. It is not on HBO, but there are means to watch it. It was on HBO. And this show is called The Corner. Okay. So I've now, only seen the title. And so now having the context of watching The Wire and knowing that... Okay, so The Wire came afterwards, and this was the sort of magnum opus... What was the corner? And we're going to view some of the same actors too, but entirely new characters. Huh. Uh, and just see what that exploration was like for those writers a few years prior to The Wire. That is fascinating. Rhyming. 